Judas Maccabeus came in the same way and we told that whole story. And we talked about it being a hero's journey and how a hero faces challenges and obstacles in their life. And being a hero, a hero's journey involves sacrifice and also involves uh, an amount of transformation in our life, of changing and growing, not staying the same way. Everybody wants transformation, don't you? We all want that. Uh, oftentimes I'll, you know, uh, be talking to somebody and, about their life or whatever, and, and they just don't know what to do. And I said, let me ask you a question. Are you, will you be happy if five years from now your life looks exactly like it does right now? And they go, oh, absolutely not. Okay, great. Well, what is it that you want to change? You know, look at it from that perspective. How do, what, how do I want to see change? So transformation is so important. And then uh, the next day, Monday, if you have your Bibles, uh, I don't know if you guys carry your Bibles, but and, um, we're looking at Mark in chapter 12. Chapter 12 starts this uh, on Palm Sunday. And then we looked at Monday. We talked about toxic religion, about Jesus going into the temple, what was going on in the temple. We talked about that last week. Uh, Jeff kind of talked about some characters in the story. So today we talked about Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday. We talked about Monday. Today, today we're t in Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, believe it or not. I know you think it's Sunday, but today's Tuesday. Interesting thing about Tuesday in the Bible is like, the most is written about Tuesday. Now, I'm not going to talk about everything that happens on Tuesday, but it's interesting to me uh, the stuff that, you know, you can read in there. So, I want to talk a minute before I get started, by way of introduction, about division. Does it seem like to you that, uh, that no matter where you look, you see division today? Right? I mean, it's just, it's kind of sad. Well, I grew up in the 70s in high school. Anybody else? 70s in high school? 70s in high school. And so um, I called my, my buddy, Scott, back there, who's been in radio his whole life, and asked him about something that I kind of vaguely remembered, and he reminded me of what it was, so I looked it up. But back when I was in school, actually I graduated in 79, and so there was this, uh, this divide in music between rock music and disco, exactly right. And so in disco music, there were groups like, uh, show a picture up there, uh, but there's some different groups up there. Uh, groups like uh, Led Zeppelin, maybe you, were, you loved Led Zeppelin, or, uh, or Styx, or ACDC, right? It was that, that kind of, there was that group. Do you remember that in high school? There were those rockers, right? Uh, and then there were uh, the other group, the disco group, and one group kind of epitomizes the, uh, put the next picture up there, Brent, of, uh, no, not them. <laughs> that's Amy. Amy, how can you do that? How can you put the, think that's a, that's a, a disco group. The Bee Gees, groups like Bee Gees and ABBA, uh, Michelle liked Abba. So there was these two different uh, factions, sort of like, a, sort of like a, a rock versus disco wars, okay? Now, I don't know if you remember this. I vaguely remember this, so I called Scott about it. Um, there was, in 1979, that's the year I graduated, there was a, uh, uh, this thing that took place through this, uh, what was his name again, Scott? I didn't write it down. That uh, DJ. Steve Dahl. Anybody remember him? He was a DJ and he was in Chicago and he had a promotional event one night at uh, Kaminsky Park in Chicago. Anybody remember that? You remember that, Tim? Yeah, yeah. By the way, oh, you remember it too. By the way, today is Tim's birthday. Hey, Tim, happy birthday. <laughs> a couple days ago was Dean's birthday. Happy birthday, Dean. Any other birthdays this month? Julie. Who? Mine. Mine's on Saturday. Saturday. Wow. Don't be shy. Yell it out. Bill, when's yours? I got birthday wishes that was done my birthday. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy birthday to you all. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I was now. <laughs> Yeah, so, so he, this was a, promo, listen to this, this is crazy. This is a promotional event. He's the DJ at a rock station. Now, I talked to Scott. Scott said, well, I was at a, D, I was at a pop station, right, then. Where were you? Remember? 
Omaha, yeah. They even had music in Omaha? Anyway, so they, uh, he was do doing more like maybe disco kind of stuff, playing that kind of stuff. So, so this guy has his promotional night, um, and it's, a, it's a, a night where there's a doubleheader. The Chicago uh, White Sox baseball team is playing. And he advertised this event called Kill Disco. And so during an intermission, he goes out in some sort of vehicle and pulls out this big thing out there, and he takes all of these disco albums out there in the middle of the field, and it, what, what does he do, Larry? He explodes them. And there, there's, there's disco, there's vinyl flying everywhere. Well, then the, the, the vinyl caught on fire. So there's this big fire out there in the middle of the field, and then guess what happens? Everybody, 50,000 people in the stands rush out. You can, you can Google it. It's crazy. They rush out onto the field, and it's just pandemonium, and they have, to, they have to stop everything. You know, second game was never played or anything. Crowd was yelling, chanting, disco sucks, disco sucks, the whole thing. But I can remember those days. I remember kids in our school. That I, you all know that I was really never into music, so it didn't matter to me. I didn't really like rock music. I didn't like disco music. I just wasn't into music. But I knew people that were. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a fullback that he loved like that hard rock, you know what I mean, like ACDC and, you know, those groups. He would always play those before games. And then we had some other people who were like, you know, wide receivers, you know, and they like dancing and that sort of thing. So they like the disco, you know. I know I just made a face and I shouldn't have made a face, but um, the police were called in to restore order and everything. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, how do, we, how do we live in these times when there's such polarization, right? Because we live in those times now. It's not new now, right? Don't you agree? It's not new now. I mean, it's been throughout all of, all of history and we'll kind of see that in here. But the question is this, how do we stay on track uh, in a divided, distracted world? How do we stay focused and how do we not get, get sidetracked? So I was with uh, my friends back and Jamie yesterday. They said, what's, what's the message about today? And I said, well, it's about Tuesday. But if, if I were to name this, I was thinking about how, what are the two subjects when you get together with, a, uh, with family or just a group, two subjects you're not supposed, not supposed to talk about? Politics and religion, right? Politics and religion, two things you don't talk about. And what's interesting here is that's exactly what we see. Now, I'm not gonna talk about everything in this, uh, but there's some interesting things here, like um, talking about uh, paying taxes and talking about, uh, uh, about commands. And so that's what we're gonna look at today, about how to stay on track. So in your notes, you have your notes there? In your notes, I, I can't remember what version I used. I just go on my site and I just copy and paste uh, some text there. Um, and so I, I brought these so I can maybe, I don't know if I wrote it in a different version on my notes here. But it says this. Let's start reading, okay? This is in Mark chapter 12. It starts out like this. Now, I don't know about you. When you read the Bible, do you, uh, do you just read it and say, oh, okay, that's, and try to get like an overall view? Or do you question when you read? Like, for example, it says this. Later, they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So you think about that. What's, what's the important bit there? Well, you think about, you look about the Pharisees and Herodians and what they're going there to try to trap Jesus. There's another word there I want you to pay attention to. It says this, later, what's the next word? They. Do you ever ask yourself who they is? Like, who's they? Because don't, because we were talking about that yesterday, weren't we, Mac, right? We're talking about when we say that, yeah, they, they say this and this and this. Well, well who the heck is They. And so here, this they, let's just spend a minute on this. Uh, they were uh, religious leaders. Now, if you know your history, if you know the Old Testament, the leadership in the temple uh, were the Levitical priesthood, okay? Those were the ones who, like for example, when, when uh, the Jews were supposed to take their tithe, which was food, take it to the temple, it was meant to provide for the Levitical priesthood because they couldn't own land, right? So they couldn't grow things. They couldn't have animals. So they had no way really to kind of feed themselves, take, take care of themselves. So the tithe was meant to do that. And so they took their tithe there in the Levitical priesthood, took that, and that's what kind of sustained them. So back to you, remember, we talked about 200 years before Jesus. There was a, a, a Judas who went into the temple. It was Judas Maccabeus. 
And at that time, there was a change that took place in the temple where no longer was it going to be the Levitical priesthood uh, that was in charge of the temple. So there was a change, and it became, uh, rather than a, rather than a, you know what I mean when I say this, like rather than a religious position, okay, it became a political position. So it's the temple, but now it became political, and it was appointed, and it can be appointed to people that weren't uh, part of the Levitical priesthood. And so what we see in the time of Jesus, uh, and, and what happened is, is that when that happens, when it gets appointed, and then, uh, you know, it kind of gets, gets passed on, and the appointments, it kind of becomes a, a, a smaller and smaller and smaller group. So if you know the story here in the Bible uh, of this week, and of course we all know the chief priest's name is Caiaphas, right? But what we, what we see a little bit later on too is there's another uh, a priest, his name was Annas, A-N-N-A-S, Annas. And Annas was another one who was appointed. Annas had five sons, and what we see is, is that Annas, when he left, he, he left the, that, that position, but never left very far from the authority of that position. And he passed it on to a son and another son and another son until we come down to the time uh, uh, that we're seeing here when it's Caiaphas. Well, Caiaphas is actually the son-in-law of Annas. And what we see is that Jesus goes before Annas first before he ever goes before Caiaphas. And so this day, uh, I know you hear this word's thrown around a lot right now, but they were like a cabal. A cabal is a small group that has, that kind of is, uh, uh, it's in the background, right? They're not, they're not, they don't want to be known or anything, but they're ones who are kind of pulling the strings and they're in charge of everything that's going on. That's why it says in the Bible here, it says later they. They didn't want to be identified. Later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians. So this, this cabal, this group of these, these, these political leaders in the temple were trying to hatch a plan. And the plan was to get rid of Jesus. They certainly weren't going to do it themselves. But they didn't need to. All they need to do is cause as much dissension, as much conflict as they could, and let it just happen on their own. So we have these two groups. So the one group, it says this. It says, later they sent some Pharisees. The Pharisees were uh, these, uh, these resistors to Roman occupation. And uh, for them, they weren't, they weren't going to pay the temple tax because they believed it was blasphemous. And we're going to see here in a minute how Jesus handles this whole situation. But so they sent the Pharisees to catch him in this, right? And they take this, they go to him with this question about uh, do we pay tax to Caesar? So just like today, this is a kind of a volatile kind of thing, question, right? We're going to talk a little bit more about taxes throughout history and so forth. It's really interesting to look at. But this other group was the uh, Herodians, and they were this, uh, they were more of a secularized uh, supporters of the Romans. They weren't uh, religious. They were these Roman Greeks, but they were, they were of the elite. And so these two groups go and, and each of these groups, it's important to know this, each of these two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they're sold out on their belief, on what they believe and what they stand for. Sold out on it. Different from each other. Matter of fact, they didn't agree on anything else except one thing. They both wanted to get rid of Jesus. So they came to him to sort of try to trick him. And they use this political hot button of taxes to, this is like perfect ambush for Jesus. Now, it's important to know some more history before we kind of go on. Um, 25, about 25 years before uh, Jesus, this time, there was another revolt in the temple. Believe it or not, it's another Judas. Judas was a popular name back then. Uh, and so there was a Judas the Galilean, and he's probably named after Judas Maccabeus, to be honest. And Judas was a, uh, I guess you'd call it a very political name uh, back then. And he went to the temple 
and said that we are not subject to Caesar and that we're not going to pay taxes and he's going to usher in the kingdom of God. And so what do you think happened to him? Right? He was killed. And so all of this is fresh in their minds. They know about Judas Maccabeus 200 years before. They know about Judas the Galilean. And so now Jesus is there. So they think this is the perfect trap for Jesus. And so, because, why? Because if Jesus says, if Jesus says, um, don't pay the tax, well now he's just like Judas the, uh, the Galilean or Judas Maccabeus. And they're thinking he's here to overthrow. You know, don't pay the tax, no, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna submit to the government. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna kill Jesus right there, right there, not gonna let that happen. But if he says, if he says to pay the tax, well, then all his followers, all those people around, they're looking at him or they're going to kind of just leave him and they're going to disband. But Jesus is just a little bit too clever for them. You know, I have a friend who's a, who's a, a, a lawyer. Uh, he's a patent attorney. And he says this. He tells me, he said, anytime, you know, you want to, you want to get everything that you, all your ducks in a row and get as much information as you can. Because when you go in the room, you want to be the smartest person in the room. And so he's telling me a story about how he was uh, uh, with another friend of mine who had some patents, and they were kind of, uh, you know, doing some, I guess maybe arbitration, you might call it, in this room. And, and so Roger's uh, kind of waxing eloquent and talking, and other people were talking. And, and then after a couple hours, my other friend said, do you mind if I say something? And he said, no. And so my friend started talking about the situation and this product that he designed and made and everything. And my friend Roger said, I sat back and I realized I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I think that's what's happening here too. You know, these, these Pharisees, these Herodians, you know, they think they're pretty slick, pretty clever. They come to Jesus, they think they're gonna trap him and pretty soon they realize that I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Show that coin, uh, Amy, I have a picture of a coin up there. Jesus asked for a denarius, that's a denarius right there. As a matter of fact, I was, I was looking at this, if you have one of those, they're worth about $3,000 right now. Anybody have one? No one has a denarius. The front of it, with the face right there, it says this, this, this particular one, says Tiberius, son of the god Augustus. Now that's important to remember. Uh, Tiberius, son of who? The god Augustus. And the back of it says this, Pontipus, Pontifus Maximus, meaning high priest. And so Jesus says, give me a coin. So Jesus takes this coin that says Tiberius, uh, he's the son of the God, and the other side says high priest. Isn't that kind of ironic? You have Jesus, the actual son of God, and our high priest takes this coin. I think it's kind of ironic. And he says this, Whose image is on it? And so they tell him. So he doesn't say, okay, then pay taxes to him. He doesn't say that. Or he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, who's, who's, whose face is on that? And doesn't read the inscription and go, how dare he call himself the son of God? He doesn't do either one of those things. He says, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they reply. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. You know, what, and it says, and they were amazed at him. You know, in modern terms, this would be a mic drop moment. <laughs> right? Whose face is on it? Caesar's. Okay. Then if it's Caesar's, give it to him. But give to God what is God. Now, what's interesting to me is this. Uh, is that Jesus doesn't go on to try to explain this at all. Doesn't, doesn't say anything more, it just kind of goes on. So I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, Jesus, maybe he couldn't, but I can. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to just talk about uh, what, what's going on here. I want us to think about this in terms of our, our own life right now. And the first thing is this, in your notes, if you're taking notes on the back there. The first thing I think that we can get from this is, uh, is Jesus is saying, don't substitute politics for God. Don't substitute politics for God. See, who is he talking, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to people that it's still at this moment in time, we're thinking that the way in which 
their kingdom that they wanted, that they thought was going to happen, was going to happen, was through politics, was through government. Isn't that right? That's what they thought. They thought Jesus was going to be another Judas Maccabeus to come in and kick out, not the Seleucids, but this time kick out the Romans and establish a earthly kingdom. And so by Jesus doing this, he's saying, listen, don't substitute politics for God. There's a book uh, by Tim Keller. It's called King's Cross. It's really a good book. And what I like to do, I like to kind of paraphrase three things out of his book that I think really kind of, you know, fit here. And they were trying to trap Jesus. And the three things they were trying to trap him in were I think the same things that we are, that we are confronted with today. The first thing is this. Political binaries. Political binaries. Two choices. Yeah, that's all you have is two. It's either this or that. It's either rock or disco. Right? Aren't we faced with those same things today? And it seems like today, whether it's in politics or whatever, it seems like those two things are getting further and further apart. And so, the question, is it right to pay tax or not? Right? Kind of binary. Take a side. What does Jesus do? Does Jesus take a side? He does not take a side. He does not fall into that trap. You see, what he does, I think, I think he, he refuses to uh, oversimplify, to make, it, to make it that binary, to make it be this or that. He refuses to do that. And, and he accepts nuance. Now, I get it. I get, we don't like nuance because we, we want things to be a little bit clearer. We want it to be this way or that way. That's what we want it. But the truth of the matter is, is that most of life, if you haven't already discovered it, most of life is gray area. Don't you think? Uh, for the simple fact that you'll have people that, smart people that you like, Right? Even when it comes down to, when it comes down to uh, biblical things, theological things, what you'll find is two very, very smart theologians coming down on two different sides of the same issue. Very smart people. Both of them saying uh, they believe that they're uh, led by the Spirit. Right? God's showing them, and they come down two different sides. It's just, usually it's not that simple. And so Jesus accepts nuance. And I think in our... Uh, in our political climate today, it's too easy to fall into the trap of binaries, right? And we're being pushed that way more and more. We have to, we're told we have to choose. We have to choose between the two extremes and there's no middle ground. But I think as Christians, we have to, we have to um, this is my own opinion, so take it as such, right? I think we have to refuse these, uh, the, these false dichotomies right? Who, who's, well, why, why is it so? Why is it that I have to choose? It's either all of this one or all of this one. But the truth be known, if, if, you're, if you're intellectually honest, I think, if you would just sit down and look at, in any, in any regards, whether it's politics or whatever, and look at the other side and go, well, I recognize there's some truth there. I recognize there's some, there's some goodness there. But see, when, when it gets more and more separate, when, when these binaries get further and further apart, then you just have to uh, say everything about that other view is just wrong. And that's, Jesus absolutely refuses to do that. Um, the thing is this, the thing is we can still, and we should, I think we're going to see this here in a minute, that we should and we can participate in the political process. So you see, Jesus isn't saying... Uh, to get out, and that's the next point. The next point is this, is political withdrawal. Political withdrawal. There were these two groups, and they weren't paying taxes. Now, there's a group called the ASEANs, and the ASEANs at the time, they were, uh, you, you poke around on YouTube, and you'll see people talk about off-grid living. Anybody ever see those? Yeah? You can admit it. It's okay. Yeah, I see those. Off-grid living, right? People go, you know, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. The ASEANs were a group like that. Matter of fact, uh, have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? 
The Dead Sea Scrolls were believed to be from the Essenes. The Essenes left, they left society, and they went into these caves and they said, we're out, we're done. I'm not paying taxes. And, and I think Jesus is saying we have to, you have to uh, avoid that as well. Uh, political binaries and also political withdrawal. And this, ha this happens over and over. Okay, now, Amy, put up that other picture. I wish Pete was here. Can you find it? So it still should be. There they are. Anybody know who those people are? You don't. I know you don't. They're called old believers. And in, in 1698, this was a group of, of uh, this is in Soviet Russia. This group uh, were upset about taxes. This is what the tax was. Uh, in Soviet Russia, they decided uh, that to, to, or, to or, in order to really fully embrace uh, modernity of their time, that beards were not good. We looked, we looked too old, too like hickish kind of thing. So the government put a tax on beards, beards. And these people, these old believers in Russia, uh, they said, no, there's no way, no way we're paying this tax. It's either pay the tax or cut your beard off. We're not paying tax, we're not cutting our beard off. So you know what they did? They went into the hills. And they disappeared. And, and uh, there was this, I was reading about it. They were rediscovered again. Uh, I think it was in like, uh, it was like 1970 something. Can't remember the date, but you can look out online. They're rediscovered. They had no idea that World War II even took place. They had no idea. And so they just withdrew from society. And that's it. Let's face it, that's a temptation. We see it all the time. See it happening even today. People withdrawing. Uh, but as Christians, I, I think this. I think that uh, you know that we're called to be salt and light to the world. Isn't that true? Well, if you, if you withdraw from society, if you withdraw from, uh, you know, if you just live in your own little community, your own little church, you don't go out there and do anything, right? Or you say, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to bash the Amish, but, you know, if they're, they're Christian, they're called to be salt and light, to have their own community and avoid everything else. How can you be salt and light in the world? And, and the Bible calls us, Jesus calls us to be salt and light in the world. And I think, and if it says that, then I think that part of being in the world, part of that, is in the political arena as well, to be salt and light in the political arena. I think we're called uh, both to be citizens of the state and citizens of the kingdom at the same time. Because we can engage in the political process and we can uh, seek to promote things like uh, justice and the common good and so forth, right? Don't you think? Don't you think we can do both? We don't have to choose one or the other. We don't have to fall back to that binary that we don't have to withdraw. And the third thing is this, is, and this is what was happening in the, uh, really strongly in the day then, was political primacy. Political primacy. In other words, the way to solve all our problems is through politics. That's the only way to solve our problems. Therefore, we must infiltrate politics, we must get into politics, and we must change from within because politics changes everything. Do you follow me? Like that's another, another way of seeing it. Another way of seeing that it, politics are, are everything. And so there's another group that wouldn't pay taxes. They were the zealots. And the zealots would revolt. Because they felt what they needed to do is they needed to do just that. They needed to get into politics so that they could change from within. What I find really interesting here is that Jesus, with this coin, he, he uses a word and he says this. He said, whose image is on it? In other words, another way to say it is, um, whose image does it bear? Does that language sound familiar to you at all as a Christian? We, we, are, we are called to be image bearers of God himself. We were created in his image. And he was saying this, fine, that's whose image is on it. Give to him whatever his image is on and give to God yourself because he is you are made in his image and give that to God right and so uh, while we have uh, 
you might say obligation to the state. We also have obligation, or maybe I'll use another word, not obligation. We have uh, allegiance to, to God. And so we, we mustn't allow our political affiliations to define us. Or, or maybe that's even too strong. To, um, yeah, I guess, that, that, I guess that's good enough as any, right? Or, or to, how about this, how about this? We can't, don't allow your political identity to overshadow who you are in Christ. To overshadow uh, being a child of God. Your identity as that. Do you follow me? So in other words, there's a, there's a hierarchy of things. So don't let the, in the political arena, don't let that be your identity. It's okay to, I'm not saying you shouldn't have identity. I'm not saying you should be wishy-washy. I'm not saying you can't stand for things. That's not what I'm, I don't think Jesus is suggesting that. And I'm certainly not suggesting that. I'm just saying that there needs to be a hierarchy of things. And I think at the bottom line is this, is Jesus is, is that picture still? You can get rid of that, the old believers. But the old believers, that they, that's why they separated. They weren't going to pay that tax. And so what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, uh, Caesar's not your main problem. You, you think he is. You think it's your main problem. Isn't that true about us today where we have difficulties in our life and we look around and we try to find out where our problem lies? And where do we look? Where do we start looking? Externally, don't we? Where our problem lies. If we could just, if I could just change this, if I could change my boss, I'll solve my problem. If I could change my job, if I could change my spouse, if I could change this, the problem is out there somewhere. If I could change that, then I'll be okay. Then we'll be okay. And what Jesus is saying is, Caesar's not your problem. You know what your problem is? Your problem's you. That's where your problem always starts. Your problem is you. It's not external from you. It's internal. And so we go from the political to the religious, the two things that you don't talk about. The next thing is this. Let's, let's, the next question that's brought to him is this. Of all the commandments... Which is the most important? Now, as soon as you read that, of all the commandments, possibly you're thinking of the Ten Commandments, right? Of all the commandments, you know that term, you've seen the, the uh, who was the, in the movie? Uh, yeah, Charlton Heston. Yeah, Charlton Heston has the Ten Commandments. So you're thinking of him. So of all the commandments, which is the most important? And, and Jesus doesn't buy into any of that too. So what do I mean by buy into it? Let me explain. In that time, in that day, there weren't just 10 commandments. There were 613 commandments. And then, aside from that, there were all these other things that, that the rabbis would add on to the 613 to prevent you from breaking those things, right? And so like when I went to school, I went to a Bible school and it was, well, it was, it was super, super conservative. And we weren't allowed to go see movies at a movie theater, right? It's not that there's something wrong with the theater, but they knew that there was uh, sex and violence and stuff like that in movies. And they said, well, that's sin. So don't go to the movie theater because you might be exposed to that and you might be attempted to do it. You follow me? So, so sex outside of marriage and, and, and killing, all that kind of, that's all bad. We don't want you to do that. But go, don't go do this. This is going to help prevent you from ever doing that. You follow me? So they added on to these things. And so there were these, there were all these laws and everything. So they came to him and they said, of all of them, which is the one that we should, uh, which is the most important? And knowing that in that day, uh, there was debate. You know, uh, in the Bible it says, uh, uh, Jesus says, um, take my yoke upon you. You ever hear that saying? Take my yoke. Well, the rabbis in that day had a yoke, and their yoke was their teaching. And so there were three, three things, three extremely, extremely important things that were highly debated amongst rabbis and looked at as being the most important topics. There are three things. One was uh, circumcision. They argued over, fought over circumcision all the time. The next was dietary laws, kosher laws. What can you eat? What can't you eat? And then the third one, probably more importantly, is Sabbath laws. 
So one rabbi might say, keep the Sabbath holy means this. You can't travel more than uh, three miles. If you walk more than three miles, you're working and you're breaking the Sabbath. Another rabbi said, no, 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 it's not that you can go five miles, but you, when you eat, you can't use your utensil and pick up more food than a certain weight because that would be considered work. You follow me? Just crazy stuff. And so they had all these laws and started asking Jesus, what's the most important one? He, said, he says this. It's actually called the Shema. He's quoting from the Old Testament. He said, of all the commandments, what's the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And then the reply is, well, uh, well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all our heart, with all our understanding, with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifice. Remember that because I'm going to have a question for you guys at the end is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And then no one dared ask him any more questions. I think I'm just gonna, I think I'm just gonna stop here. I think I'm gonna leave you with these thoughts. I, I have a lot more to say, but it's not rocket science, right? To love, to love. Living out this great commandment is for you to figure out how do we do this. You know, I did a, a podcast the other day uh, with Scott and Scott's son-in-law. It was a really, really good podcast. And at the end, we, we kind of talked about all different kind of stuff. And I said, in the end, I know this sounds trite and it sounds so just like it's Christianese, but I really believe it. And I said this, the bottom line, love is the answer. No matter what the question is, Love's the answer. But friends, we have to figure out what that looks like in our life. And so I have a, I have a question I want to leave you with for you to kind of uh, ponder. Um, it's this. This man says that, that this command to love. Matter of fact, you have a pen. I want you to get a pen out. Get your phone. I want you to type this down. I want you, I really want you to think about this. The man says... To love God and others is more important than what? See, it's more important than. So in your notes there, sacrifice or burnt offerings, right? So this is something they did at the temple. They were, they were meant to go take this. this. This is, matter of fact, how they appeased God, what they thought, how they appeased Him, and how they would get forgiveness and so forth. They would have these sacrifices. And he says that love is more important than these things. So my question for us is this. Loving God today is more important than, and I'll leave a blank line, for you in your life today. Loving God is, in that day, that was deemed to be one of the most important things ever. Loving God and loving, uh, and sacrifices, burnt offerings. And he says, loving God with your whole being, giving him yourself, and loving your neighbor as yourself is more important. This is, this is an amazing thing for someone to say. For someone to be in that setting, to understand, uh, understand what it meant to be a good Jew, and to say that this command that Jesus said is more important than that. More important than that. So what is it today for you? What is it today that you should be able to say this commandment is more important than that in my life. Let's stand. My, my, my prayer is going to be simple for us today. And that's this. Not to, for us to, to us to be wise and not fall into the traps of, of uh, overestimating the things that are going on in the world. And, and, and worrying too much about those things and putting our, putting our hope, our faith, and our trust in God. And that, like Huey Lewis said, right, the power of love 
is a curious thing. It's a curious thing. And, and I don't think we ever give it enough chance, enough opportunity. So God, my prayer is this, that God, you help us to be wise and to seek love in our life. To, to question every day in our own heart, what does it mean to love you with everything I have? How, how will that affect my daily life if I start out every morning thinking, God, I want to love you with all my being and love my neighbor as myself. That's how I begin my day. God, help us to, to, to ponder that and then live our life each day with that before us and trying to live that out. God, we ask that you help us as we even set our mind to be intentional about our actions in loving you and loving others. And God, through that, I believe, just like it was 2,000 years ago, that the world can be changed. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, friends. Have a great